Okay, let's start the session now. Uh, hello guys, good morning and welcome you all in this Global Azure Bootcamp. Uh, please note that guys, we are delivering two topics. First will be Exploring Generative AI and second will be Master DevOps Azure Artifact. Each topic conduct uh, two hours. So let's moving ahead and talking about event sponsor that is Synergetics. Synergetics is a Mandia kind of co-porting learning solution company. Now you will get a question like who we are and what we're doing. So answering your question, we boost our offering also give comprehensive advisory service to client who wish to modernize their framework. We educate, advise and implement and manage. Then the Synergetics solution offering that is Persona based onboarding solution, onboarding add on solution, certification solution, certification add on solution, reskilling solution, emerging technology training solution, certification hackathon solution, cloud adoption solution, latest technology training solution, sales pre sales training solution, practice playbook solution, and architecting solution. Then what does Microsoft certification does? It will give you complete learning experience. You will get trained to build, appear for the exam, and get certified. Uh, this is skilling journey here. You can advance uh, yourself. First, you have to complete fundamental certification. Then you can go with the advanced role based certification, then expert level certification. Here you can see which we provide training. If you want any training, you can connect with us. I already shared contact details on chat box. This is all paid trainings which we provide. Certification offering. So certification will help you to increase your visibility, expand your knowledge and skills. We do provide certification add-on, onboarding add-on like short duration modules and more. Moving ahead, today training is organized and handled by ATC community. So our ATC community is open to all the people who are interested in our cloud technology and various emerging technology. Under ATC community, we have emerging technology community for all, Azure Tech community for Punekers. Emerging technology community for Suratkas, Azure Tech community for Nagpurkas. Guys, you just have to install the Meetup app and you can follow our communities there. Then you have to follow code of conduct, which will create a respectful environment for all the participants. Please note participants are not allowed to take screenshot of the presentation and cannot do screen recording. We will try to upload this training on our official YouTube channel. So guys, today we have two speakers with us. Uh, first will be Mahendra Shinde. He is a Microsoft certified trainer and currently work with Synergetics as a practice head. And second will be Navjoti Barua. He is, a, he is also a Microsoft certified trainer and currently work with Synergetics as an AVP technology. Agenda for this webinar, webinar, you will get to know more about the topic and certification. Uh, hello, Archie. Are you there? Yes, sir. Your uh, screen is not visible, madam. You're sharing anything? Yes, uh, I shared. Just a second, I will share again. <clears throat> So now it is visible. <laughs> yes, yes, now it's visible. We should we start again? No, it's OK. You just run the PPT. That's it. OK. Slowly. Slowly, madam.
this guys we are providing you a 900 learning achievement batch here you can see the steps and you just have to follow the step and you will get the activated batch make sure guys you follow us on our linkedin facebook twitter and youtube for upcoming webinar details thank you now i would like to hand over this mic our speaker she will he will continue ahead yeah thank you rc so let me share my PT. Okay, so hope everyone can see my PPT and everybody can hear me. All right. Thank you. So very good morning to all of you. Let me set the context for this two hours training on topic. As you can see on the screen, it's all about exploring generative AI from Microsoft Cloud Platform. So generative AI is a talking point now. So we are going to look at what generative AI is all about and how we can make use of generative AI in different use cases. Maybe we would go and explore in a day to day life, how generative AI can enhance the productivity, what we have been doing from so many years. So my name is Navjoti Barua, as Arshi has already, already introduced. So I am a cloud solution architect. So I have been extensively working with these technologies from right to dotnet to react and from the cloud as your aws and gcp and working in the field extensively uh, on the artificial intelligence and the generative ai so i'm being certified with a couple of certifications from the microsoft uh, Azure, the cloud platforms, as you can see, right from the Azure administrator to Azure AI engineer. So generative AI would be coming under the Azure AI engineers. So this would be a full course uh, under this a particular title through which you would be learning how to implement not only the generative AI, the traditional AI that we typically infuse into our application. So today's agenda would be introduction to the generative AI, and then getting into the Microsoft Cloud Platform, exploring the open AI service to implement the generative AI concept, and then how Microsoft as your OpenAI service can be used in different use cases in different categories. This is what primarily we are going to discuss during this session. So feel free to ask questions. So if you need to know more about what we are going to explore and what would we'll be discussing during this session. So if you think that you should ask questions, so feel free to ask questions anytime whenever the conversation would be progressing during this particular session so then then let's get started with uh, what is generative ai now we need to go back to the fundamental first to get coming back to the generative ai so we started implementing artificial intelligence long back as you can see on the screen now what are the basic 
understanding of artificial intelligence. So artificial intelligence is typically saying that offloading the human capability to the application. So application behave like a human. So it could be in different a field, maybe artificial intelligence in the field of uh, the vision, the visions related to images, related to videos or related to the live streaming where artificial intelligence can be implemented. Artificial intelligence can be implemented in the field of language and the text. Like, for example, I want to detect a language. And subsequently, I want to translate that particular language to some other languages. With the help of artificial intelligence. Or maybe finding the sentiment of given a review for a particular product or a particular hotel stay. So this is typically done by the application. So applications can figure out whether the review was positive or a negative or a neutral. So we can go on on and on and list of capability possibly around the artificial intelligence without bringing human into this context. So your application is capable of doing those tasks that is being done by the human. And that's how the artificial intelligence has come into the picture. But that is a very abstract level of implementations, or maybe we can say, OK, this is an AI application. But what goes behind the AI application? It's all about machine learning and deep learning. So machine learning is a basically a subset of artificial intelligence where we go and create the AI models. And we do not want to go into the detail of that. So what is basically a model? The model can do the predictions, model can do the classifications, and model can do different things in the field of artificial intelligence. Now, how the model is being prepared depends what kind of outcome that we can expect from that particular model. But what is the outcome of the model? It is being used to train a huge a set of data to learn from the data and eventually create a model. And subsequently, those model can be used for predictions used for classifications or clustering. So machine learning is a subject. In the broader level where we can create model from the historic data or maybe a real time data and subsequently that model can be used by the artificial intelligence AI application. Then getting into the deep learning. So again, the deep learning would be. Advanced concept of the machine learning where. You need to train a huge amount of data. You need to understand the, the complex data and their patterns and their trends and their relations. In that context, the deep learning will come into the picture, but deep learning also eventually go and create a model but the deep learning can resolve the concept complex problem that we need to solve by learning from the data. So like how human learn from the data or by how human learn from any sources, like deep learning also can learn from the data because that would be a set of neural network, like how your brains work with the help of neuron to understand or to learn something and subsequently the human can implement. The similarly, the deep learning also being a subject of the machine, a uh, subject of artificial intelligence, where we can go and train huge amount of data, the complex data that you want to learn and eventually create a model from by learning from the data 
and that model can be consumed from AI applications to do the predictions, to do the classifications, or do many things related to the artificial intelligence. So eventually what we are saying that the most of the tasks the human does would be offloaded to AI application. So AI application is going to take over the day-to-day -day job that we do from the human. And the last, the today's topic would be a generative AI. This is a complete different type of artificial intelligence. It is different from the traditional artificial intelligence. The traditional artificial intelligence was mainly responsible for predicting or maybe classifying or maybe a clustering or maybe some kind of analyzing the existing data or a new data that will come into the system. But generative AI is responsible for recreating new content, the original content. It may be in a form of text, it may be in a form of image, or it may be in a form of videos. So this is how the generative AI is different from the traditional AI. It is not just to make decision. It is not just do the predictions. It is not just do the classifications. Generative AI will be responsible mainly for creating new content, creating original content in a form of text, in a form of image, in a form of videos. And that is the difference between the two AI of what we have been discussing at this moment. The question is that how am I going to make use of this generative AI from the Microsoft Cloud platform? Because since the primary focus is the Microsoft Cloud and what is there for us to walk around with the generative AI? What I have been doing, uh, I have been explaining, like for example, how to create a new text. So suppose, for example, I want to write a story. I can give a subject to write a story. Generative AI can write a story for me. Or maybe I want to create an image with my imagination. So I can do the well narrative of that image that I want to see. The generative AI will create an image for me. Generative AI can create music also. Generative AI can create videos also. But this is based on the prompt. The prompt means the input text, what precisely that you are looking for, what you want to get out of the generative AI. So that would be well defined by writing an effective prompt eventually. So prompt is going to be a very important component or an aspect in order to work with the generative AI. Because if you're writing an effective prompt, you are going to get a more relevant result that you might be anticipating, you might be looking for. So NetNet is this very simple technology for us without going into the deep detail of how the generative AI is responsible for generating new content. But for me, as an end user, I just need to write the appropriate prompt to get the response from the generative AI. And this generative AI also being used, I mean, the generative AI in the background, they're using a model. And this model are called as a large language model. Unlike the traditional model, this model are very robust. Who can create new content for me based on the prompt that we are writing to the generative AI. So as I was coming back to the point, so what practically we can implement the generative AI? So I need a platform, so I need a kind of service in an abstract environment that I can consume from my applications. I can go and play with generative AI service to see their capability. And that's how we get into the Microsoft as your open AI resources. Now we get to know this is an open AI because the open AI is an independent 
organization. It is not a big organization, US based organizations who has started working on large language model. And they are responsible for generating new content. But the Microsoft has invested on the open AI and whatever the model is being created by the open AI is made available through the Microsoft Cloud Platform. The consumer of the Microsoft Cloud Platform can make use of those models, which was originally created by the open AI vendors. But for customer, it is made available through Microsoft as your cloud platform. We can select a particular model and we can deploy that model under your own subscription and you will be billed by the model deployment that you did under your subscription. So there would be a different billing. The techniques, how we are going to pay for the Azure OpenAI service, which is globally available, you can figure it out. But as I said, the OpenAI and Microsoft is two different entity altogether. So OpenAI, the creator of the LLM, but the Microsoft Azure made them available from their cloud platform. The consumer of those models can come to the Microsoft Azure cloud platforms and make use of those models from their application or through Azure Open AI service. So the net net Azure Open AI service is going to give us a REST API to get access to the OpenAI powerful language model, including the GPT-4, GPT-3.5 Turbo, embedding models, and few more. So these are the name of the model that you can go and get access to them from Microsoft Azure by deploying explicitly those models and make use of this model from your applications with the help of OpenAI service. The rest is you just need to go and kind of uh, go uh, to the Azure and create the OpenAI resources, like how you have created the other resources from Microsoft Azure. But at this moment, Microsoft Azure OpenAI is a limited access. The limited access means if you are using your own subscriptions, you may not get access to the OpenAI until you apply for the OpenAI service by going into the aka.am OAI apply, OpenAI apply. So this is the URL that you can see. So you need to fill up the form under which subscriptions that you want to enable the OpenAI and what are the models that you want to enable behind the OpenAI. All specifications need to be submitted from the forms that you can find in this particular URL. So if you browse this URL, so you are going to ask the set of the questions, so you need to submit the answer to those questions. And in 48 or for 24 hours or maybe 48 hours, your subscription would be enabled to access as your OpenAI services. But by default, OpenAI services is currently with a limited access until you go and ask for the access. You are not going to get like you get to access the rest of the services from the Microsoft Azure. This is one information that you have to have at this moment. So net net, we can go to the open AI or we can go to the portal and create an open AI service or. We can go and take help of the CLI command line interface. To create. Open AI resource under my subscription. But before doing this, I need to go and apply for the OpenAI that could enable the OpenAI access from my subscription. 
Now, as I say this, the OpenAI and Microsoft is the two different entities, the two different vendors altogether. So that's how the Azure OpenAI service gives customer advanced language AI with the Azure OpenAI. In fact, if you go to the openai.com, so they have their own independent website also. You can go to their website and see the list of the product, mainly the list of the model they have created. And what I'm saying that those model is made available through Microsoft Azure, whether it is GPT-3 or GPT-3.5 or GPT-4 or Codex or a DAL-E or which part. These are the different model that is eventually created by the OpenAI and made available to our customer via the Microsoft Cloud Platform that is Azure One. Now, by having them through an Azure, we are going to get more secure environment to use those models because the Microsoft Cloud Platform does not only give us the list of the services, but at the same time, it gives up the in infrastructure and the other implementations around the securities, capabilities, what we can see. So OpenAI become more robust in context of Microsoft Azure because the Microsoft Azure is going to give us the other prerequisite to run OpenAI model in an enterprise environment. So mainly we can talk about the security and the infrastructure by having your own infra to run those model and those model subsequently would be accessed by your application that is also going to deploy it on the same cloud platform. OK, so that is how probably we can. Go and make use of it. Uh, yeah, so this is this is what we have been talking about so far. Now, as I said, by having OpenAI from Microsoft Cloud, it become easy, be, be easy to access because I would be in an integrated environment. The everything would be made available to me. From the security, from the infrastructure, along with the model that I can select to deploy that can be accessed via the REST API, which is Azure OpenAI service. Now, once you have deployed the Azure OpenAI service, before we go and consume that service from our applications, we are given a kind of playground. And that playground is called as an Azure Open AI Studio. Or now it could be Open AI. Uh, yeah, so Azure Open AI Studio or an AI Studio, Microsoft AI Studio, that we are going to see different product that we are going to get that we can play with those services. So we are going to get some kind of playground. So essentially what I'm saying that as your OpenAI Studio provide a, some kind of web-based portal in which you can manage the model and the deployment in the Azure OpenAI resources. You can access it from the resource piece in Azure portal or directly at oai.azure.com as you can see. This is where we have to go and get access to the OpenAI Studio. So primarily what I'm saying that this OpenAI Studio is going to give us a playground to test my OpenAI service. But before we test, it allow us to deploy the model, what kind of model that I would like to deploy 
and how I want this model to be consumed from the OpenAI service, all would be made available from this web portal, what we can see. We are going to explore all of them, then we'll get the flow of using as your OpenAI Studio. So what need to do first and what need to be done second and what need to be done third in order to use as your OpenAI service. But before we go and deploy model and consume the model through OpenAI service, let us talk about the few generative AI model. These are called LLM, Learn Language Model. We have been talking about Generative Pre-trained Transformer, GPT. Now, if you go back to the history of the model families, it started from the transformer families. The transformer is basically responsible for generating the text without losing the context. So that model can generate or one line of text or a hundred line of text, but while they would be generating, they don't lose the context. So that's how the generative AI become so powerful in context of generating content. But as I said, these are the list of model because GPT-3 was introduced before GPT-4. Now GPT-5 is going to come this year. But this is what, this is an enhancement to reduce the hallucinations. Like sometimes we may not get an appropriate result due to the incapability of that particular a model. So making model more capable of generating content while generating content by limiting the hallucinations from the content is all about the goal of those vendor who is currently dealing with the large language model. So eventually we are going to see the model who can completely eliminate the hallucinations from the result from the outcome that Gen AI is going to produce days to come or years to come. So there are different type of modeling. So how this inter model, how this model internally work to produce the outcome. It could be in a form of embeddings or a, embedding is all about your text embedding for a specific task like similarity text. But embedding is basically going to convert your text into a vector representations. And uh, the vector is a series of number to identify a text within a context. And since it would be a kind of vector representations, and they will be able to represent the text, they will be represent the videos, they would be represent the images by a vectors, by the numbers. And that's how they will be able to keep information together if they are similar. So suppose you are talking about a particular city, like New York City, through a set of a paragraphs or maybe through a set of videos or maybe through a set of images. So all can be put together on the vector. All can be converted into a vectors and they can be related among them because all of them are basically presenting one city like New York cities. So in order to generate the text, if somebody go and ask questions, so it can contextualize the informations from all type of informations that is being presented in a form of vectors by the embedding. So these are the internal concept that I'm talking about. You may not need to go and understand in detail what I'm saying it. It can be kind of uh, just assume as a model uh, who can deliver eventually a content that you are looking for based on the prompt that you have written. That is the main point. And like DAL-E is responsible for generating images. 
as I said before also, like text, we can generate the image also. I can write a prompt to kind of, uh, to generate the images. So what kind of image that I'm looking for, I can write, I can do the description of the image and DAL E is going to produce the image with me. So we are going to look at all of them. We'll see that where can I find those model when I am inside my Microsoft Azure a portal. So we are going to look at those. So I said the, as a first steps, we have to go and deploy the generative AI model first. So this is your CLI through which we can command line interface through which we can deploy a particular model by naming that model. So you are deploying a model called GPT-35 Turbo. That is the name of the model that we are going to deploy under a particular resource group. The format is the OpenAI and the OpenAI under the standard pricing tier because OpenAI is going to use this model eventually. Because OpenAI would be just a rest endpoint that your developer, AI developer is going to consume. But behind the rest endpoint, there is a model. And every model will have a version. So you can see the version also. So all details goes at the time of creating or at the time of deploying the model, because eventually your model need to be associated with the OpenAI service. So once the model is being deployed, then we come back to what are the tasks that we want to perform. Typical example that I would like to bring in front of you. That I'm expecting from the deployment I did in my previous Suppose I did the deployment of the OpenAI, now what? What possibly I can get out of this OpenAI service? So I can classify content, I can generate new content, I can translate the content, I can summarize the existing content, I can do some kind of continuations because I can start something and my OpenAI is going to go and kind of complete that question answering, and of course, I can make use of my open AI in a form of conversations where we talk about the chat applications, maybe a bot applications where we can do the bi bi-directional communications out there. So in the, com in, in, in the chat completions, we can talk about different way of doing the conversations with the end user or with the AI applications in a form of maybe a, something like chatbot. So these are the different, maybe you can say as a use cases for the Azure OpenAI service. And these are the prompt that you are going to write in order to get response from the OpenAI who basically go and use a model behind the OpenAI service. In Microsoft Azure, also take us to a, another the playground, as I said before, the studio that I talked about, where we can go and play with the deployed model. But the first thing we have to go and deploy and then subsequently we can go and make use of that deployment. To understand how. This deployed service can be used in different use cases in different context. And that is what we are going to do now. So practically we are going to explore. Right from deploying an open AI service then deploying a model behind the OpenAI service. And subsequently, we can make a call to the OpenAI service to do different things by writing different prompt. And that could be aligned to the different use cases 
what I have been talking about. So net net, what we have understood till now, we should be able to differentiate between the first, the traditional AI and the generative AI. The traditional AI is responsible for predicting, responsible for doing classification, responsible for making decision. On behalf of human by the application, that's how the artificial intelligence has come into the picture. But generative AI is totally different. So generative AI is responsible for creating new content in a form of text, in a form of image, in a form of videos or in a form of music. But that would be completely depends on the prompt that you are going to write to the generative AI model, the LLM, what we have been discussing, large language model. So with that core concept of the generative AI, I would like to take you to the platform, the Microsoft Azure, through which we can implement the generative AI concept, the via Azure OpenAI service. I'm repeatedly saying that the model behind the Azure OpenAI service is being created by different vendors. Microsoft also has come up with their own model, but the primarily the GPT model, which is one of the most popular model that is being used by chat GPT from the open AI today in the conversational AI, in the field of conversational AI today, you can just go and ask any questions in any subject. Chat GPT can respond to your questions, respond to your prompt. And the same model that is going to be used from the Microsoft Azure through Azure Open AI service. So let's jump into this demos like to make you understand what I have been talking about to look at practically how these model can be implemented from the Microsoft Cloud Platform. So while I'll be doing this demo, so I'll stop my video now. So and then I'll be going into a different machines and from there I will go and give you the demo and when I come back to my presentations again I'm going to on my videos. OK, so before I go to this, I can see a one questions coming. I do not have an official work ID. How do I access as your open AI studio? So no. First to to get first to you have to have. You have to. Have your. As your subscription. First. I'm just writing there. And then you need to enable Open AI access basically. And then from as your portal, you can go to Open AI Studio.
sorry. Yeah, so this is the steam. OK. So hope you can see uh, my. Desktop at this moment. So I haven't done this. I was responding to the queries that I have received from the team. Uh, you should not get a blank screen, so you should see my browser now. Just let me know whether you can see the browser that I'm sharing with you. OK. So who cannot see it, please re-log into the meeting. Probably you can see that one. All right. So what I was talking about. The first thing. I said we need to go and create. As your open AI service. That is the first thing that we have to do. But I said one thing, suppose you have your. Uh, what do you call it? you have your uh, subscription? But the first thing you have to go and enable the subscriptions. To open AI access by going into this particular. Uh, I can just go and take a notepad to just to reiterate myself. So what I'm saying that first to you need to go. To this particular uh, to get access to the open AI. Again, I'm saying that why do we need that? To get access. To as your open AI service. But before that. You need to have. need a, as your subscription All right the so first thing you need an as your subscription whether it is a free or paid it doesn't matter that is first thing that you need to have and then you will definitely going to get a subscription ID. Of your subscription. And that ID. That you will be using when you are filling up this form, so it says I want to access the open AI from my subscription, so you have to mention the subscription ID while you are filling up this form like this is the form that I'm talking about. So somewhere you have to go and get the subscription IDs and you need to put here. And then you can go below and he said, what are the model that you are interested to consume? You can see the GPT-3, GPT-3.5 Turbo, GPT-4, GPT-4 Turbos. I would like to use all of them. In fact, the Dal E, 2 and the 3s and Whisper, speech to text you can your generative AI can take input as a speech and convert into a text. And you can go and get. With the vision also you can see all kind of the details. What. Uh, this model is all about about the license about the limitations and so on and so forth. Right, so this is just to give you insight. So this is the steps that you need to follow. So in my case, I have already done this. 
Now I can straight go and create an open AI service from my subscription. So my subscription is enabled with open AI access, open AI service access. So now I can go into my all service. And I can go to the AI plus machine learning. And I go to the Azure AI service. And I can. See, this is the first one called Azure OpenAI account, so I can go and create this Azure OpenAI account. So I'll create one resource group. And under that resource group, I'm going to create a demo OAI. Open a service and pricing tier is standard at this moment. The rest I will be keeping as a default. And we'll try and create an open AI service from the Microsoft Azure cloud platform. So in 30 seconds to one minute, the deployment would be completed. And then we can go to the OpenAI Studio to deploy the model behind this particular OpenAI service. And then subsequently, we can go and consume that model via this service. OK, this is done. I can go to that resource. This is my Azure OpenAI service. So I have a link directly. Go to Azure OpenAI service. I can open in a new link. And this is where we are seeing that. Where do I find this? Sorry. So this is the place for uh, Open AI Studio. All right. So currently I'm in Open AI Studio. So what is the first thing that I need to do? I need to go and deploy a LLM. What we have been discussing like GPT. 3.5. GPT 4. Etc. The large language model. All right. 
So this is something like we can do the model management also, like creating, deleting, all kind of stuff, configuring, all can be done from this OpenAI Studio currently I am in. So if I go to the management sections of the OpenAI Studio, the first thing I get to see the deployment. So do I have any deployment? No, I don't have any deployment, so I have to go and deploy a model that can be used from my OpenAI service. As you can see, my OpenAI service is already being selected here. This is my OpenAI service. So the model that I'm going to deploy that is going to be used via this particular service. So the context is different. Like suppose I can go and create a, another one. Suppose let me go. Where do I where did I create? This service, suppose I'm going with another region, so East US. So I'll create a, another service. Let me go to the AI one. This time I'll go and select uh, maybe West US. And then I can go and say demo OAI SRV. This is something what I'm giving it. Because my target location is different now. And I'm deploying a different OpenAI service. So my OpenAI service is being made available in two places. One is this is my East US. The another I'm going to deploy it in the West US, two different regions where I have gone and deployed two different OpenAI service. And both OpenAI service can have a different deployment. So I can have one model in the service that I have deployed in the East US. I can have another model deployed in the service that I have deployed somewhere in the West US. So anyway, so we'll go and see it now. First thing we'll go into the first one, the East US one. You can see that is the East US on the top. So I'll be going into the West US one also, so I can go there. You can see this. This is the service that I have selected somewhere in the West US, and I can also go and open it into my OpenAI Studio. So I'm going to get a new interface and this time we get the West US. So I have got two and here also we need to go to the deployment. Now let's come back to the first one and say what model that I want to deploy. I can see the model catalog so I can go to the model. So this is the model catalog that has come from the Microsoft Azure. It says you pick up one of the model. And then go and. Deploy these model behind your services. So I can start from. Model like uh, GPT 3.5 Turbo 16K GPT 4 with a different version because this is the model versions. So the model keep updated time to time. You have to go back to the catalog and their specification, how they are different. But eventually the main category that we need to understand. So GPT is more to create a text by having your prompt. OK, so that is something that we need to know. All right. So now I go to the I can pick one of them. So now I go to the deployment. And I can create a new deployments and I can select the. Models. Which is available. In the East US. For the deployment. Because that is again so based on the quota. 
for your subscriptions that is made available that you can deploy into this particular region where the OpenAI service got created. So I'll go with this GPT 3.5 Turbo 16K. That is the deployments. Deployment type would be standard. I'm just giving my GPT 35 the Turbo. That is the name that I'm giving. It could be any name that you want to give because that name would be used when you are going to tell your service to make a call to that particular model. So we have to precisely give the name from our code. That will take a look later on how this is going to be done. So rest, I'm going to go with the default one. So I can basically um, go and increase the token per minute late also. Now, what is basically a token? So when you write a prompt, the prompt could be a one word or a collection of words. As I said before, because you have to always write an effective prompt that the generative AI understand and work on your prompt to give you the response. OK. So the token is a tiny part of your prompt. So your prompt is going to be broken into the multiple. Uh, the prompt is going to be broken into the multiple tiny parts and we call them as a token. So eventually, how many token is being processed by the generative AI model on that basis, I'm going to go and get the bill. So more token means more cost. So number of text or number of word is being generated by the generative AI is all about the cost that you are going to pay. Right, so that is something that you need to understand. So later on, that token comes like when you say token means so tokens we need to understand more, but you can always go and see the token a per minute limit I can set. So in per minutes, how many token that I want to consume as an outcome of the generative AI model, including the prompt that we have written. So that is all about, so you can increase the quota that you have set dynamically whenever you feel like. So with that specifications, we deployed the first model, GPT 3.5 Turbo model, 16K model to generate that text. So model deployment is going on. So once it is deployed, I should be able to use this model from the playground, as you can see here. That is successful, you can see that. This is the model that we deployed. So now I can go to the playground. So one of the most used playground is all about conversational AI, artificial intelligence in a form of chatbot. And this is what we get. So there are three sections, the setup. This is the section from where I can initiate my chatting. And there is a configurations where I can go and pick up the model. 
that I have deployed. I can have a multiple model. I can select which model that I want to use while I'm using interacting with my generative AI. And there would be a parameter also. We'll be talking about parameter later on. So as I said, this is my playground. And this playground is having the three section. So used to set up the context for the model response. That is your setup. Used to submit the messages and get the response and used to configure the settings for the model deployment. So we are going to go and see out there. So now if I go to the setup first, it say that used to set up the context for the model response because the generative AI in context is really huge because generative AI can talk about any subject. But it is always better to tell the generative AI in what context that you are going to ask questions. In the field of science and technology, in the field of medicines, in the field of environmental science, in the field of games, in the field of something else. So setting context is important to get quick and more relevant outcome under this particular context. So you can see there are multiple pre-created template in the setup one. They're already using template, they say it. So what kind of template that is available? You can see these are the deep template. So if I go to a, the default template system message, because now it is using the default one. So you are an AI assistant that help people to find information. There may be an example also. How you are expecting a response from the Gen AI. You can also set examples by just adding example out there. And that is going to be redefining the kind of prompt that you would be writing. And there is a subject called prompt engineering around this. What possibly you can do to personalize your generative AI by setting context, by providing example that should be considered when the AI is going to respond to your prompt. And that is all about prompt engineering. So there are different techniques that is being used to write prompt. It's not just going and writing anything you would like to write to get response from the generative AI. So there is a technique, so that needs to be followed to get maximum out of the generative AI any given context. So I'm going with the default system messages like I can go and change it by selecting very specific context like if I select Xbox customer support as in. So it means I'm going back and telling my LLM that all the questions that would be. That is going to be asked. It is all around the Xbox. The information that you want to provide related to the Xbox, you are going to get through this kind of conversations by setting the system messages around the Xbox customer support as in. But now I make it very simple one, the default one, but I would like to see how I'm going to communicate with this, with that system one. Just Going back to that one only. So let me go back and write 
my first prompt. How can I use generative AI to help me to market a new product? So I am basically asking the generative AI, I am about to market a new product. So how do I get help from the generative AI? This is the prompt that I am writing. So if I go and click on this, so it will give me a step-by-step -step guidance what you need to do. So generative AI can be a powerful tool to assist you in the marketing a new product. Yeah, there is some way that can be leverage the generative AI marketing a process. It says how many token is being used so far. We got a pop up out there. To give you the details out there, the response that we get. The token breakdown. So system masses was created 11 token. Estimated max token and all these things, user queries, and so on and so forth. And masses history already 393 token that we use from this particular conversation. But you see what is being told by the generative AI. So you can review the response always. You can note the model has generated the cohesive natural language answer that is relevant to the query with which it was prompted. We can also set up a, another prompt. Like this. He said, what skill do I need if I want to develop a solutions to accomplish this? This is also going to give it. So you said AI and the machine learning that you need to know little bit of it. The familiarity with the AI machine learning concept is crucial. Understanding how generative AI model works, their limitations and the training process will help you to develop effective solutions. The knowledge of the popular framework like TensorFlow, PyTorch is beneficial. So if you want to develop an applications in Python, so you need to know the libraries like TensorFlow or maybe the PyTorch. The another subject that you might have to get into called data science and of course the programming and of course the domain knowledge marketing and communications and maybe designing and creativities research and analysis project management so you have given step by step so what are the full things one may not be learning all of them but maybe a team who may be an expert on a particular subject can help each others in order to create a successful marketing campaign solutions by having the underlying knowledge that is typically required to build solutions around what we have been asking for. Right, so we can go and clear this, whatever the conversation that we are having, we can start with because if I keep asking questions that will be always keeping the context alive. Like for example, uh, if I'm 
doing a conversation on a particular topic when I am writing a subsequent prompt, I do not have to explicitly take the reference of the topic. So the GPT understand the contextual conversations. Like, for example, if I ask, what is the populations in India? And it will give me the, the populations detail of India. And at the same time, the next prompt, I can simply ask, what about Australia? So I don't have to go and explicitly say what is the population of Australia because the GPT understand that we are in the middle of conversations by setting a context of populations. So I do not have to go and explicitly write the prompt by mentioning the populations. If I want to know the populations from any other countries in the world. So that's how the contextual abilities is being a part of the GPT model, any generative model what we are talking about. So I'm clearing that context. I can start with the new one, it will be deleted the current history to save that you can do this also, but I'm cleaning up. So I'm going with the new one. So it said, can you help me to find the resource to learn this skill? So you can see that they are asking for So you just need to go and kind of Tell that in what subject that you would like to know more about that. So from this response, what we get to understand. Since the previous, the history has been lost. The answer is likely to be about the finding the generic skill resource rather than being related to a specific skill needed to build a generative AI marketing solutions that we have discussed last conversation, because now the generative AI has lost the context. We started with the new context, and this is why they are asking. It would have been different response if it would have used this prompt without clearing the history that we had before. So this is a kind of, you know, just to understand the power of the generative AI, what we are discussing at this moment. The power of the generative AI is all about what we have right in front of you. Okay, so I can go and Let's try a few more stuff so you understood the few things at this moment. Uh, and of course, I can go and get uh, a kind of template here so I can just continue with this. The default template. What we get out there. And or maybe I can go and get a marketing a writing assistance that we can see out there. This is a template that I would like to use. So with the default system messages, now system messages change from the previous one. So you are a marketing a writing assistance, so you help come up with the creative content idea and uh, the content like marketing emails, blogs, post, tweet, ad copies, and so on and so forth, as you can see in that system messages. 
He write a friendly yet professional tone, but can tailor to your writing style that best work for the user. So this is a very elaborative context that you have set. That making no mistake, whoever is going to take the help from the generative AI for a marketing campaign. Their response should be very relevant. That is being well defined in the system messages. It's all about setting the context to an LLM how the LLM is supposed to respond when the prompt will come from the end user. So with that, I can go and start writing a prompt because now it is very specific what we want to know. So suppose I go and write the prompt to create an advertisement for a new scrubbing brush. Something like this. So if I go and set this prompt. So you get to see the response. So this is the marketing campaign. Artifacts that we have got from the generative AI. All is being incorporated. What is being mentioned during the system messages. It said with a creative content idea. and content like marketing emails, blog posts, tweets and copies and the product description. You write to a friendly yet professional tone. But tailor your. A writing style that best work for the user specified audience and so on and so forth. So you can just take a look what is being defined out here. So accordingly, we get that response. Now, without losing that con as I can re or fine tune my prompt. So this is all about writing an effective prompt. There would be other techniques. So this session, we won't be able to elaborate the prompt engineering in detail. But you are going to get some kind of input that how you can fine tune your prompt to get maximum out of the generative AI, what we are discussing at this moment. So I'm saying that revise the advertisement for the scrubbing brush. Name now I'm specifically giving a name. OK. It's made of carbon fibers and reduce the cleaning time by half compared to the ordinary scrubbing brush. That is something what we can see at least. So I can just go with this. Now your response would be different from the earlier ones. So categorically, they are talking about unmatched cleaning performance, comfortable and egomorphic design, the versatility is at the finest, built to last, and so on and so forth. So which is different from what we have received as a generic one, because this time we made it very specific what kind of stuff that we want to go and do it.
Now we can still go and have more control on the outcome by adding example. So this is something that I can do. So it means in order to make your response more useful or more specific or getting more control over the output from the model, you can always provide one or more. What we call as a one sorts or a few sorts example on which the response should be based on. So what I can write as an user. So here I'm going with. So write an advertisement for a, a lightweight. Ultra mop mop. Which use the. Patented absorbent material to clean the floor. So this is a kind of specifications that we are using. And in answer. The assistant means we are referring to the generative AI model. So you say this welcome to the fuser of cleaning. So you have defined how you want your response to come. These are the detail. And you have given the reference also check out more about this product by going into this particular website. Now with this you can just go and. Write a new prompt. So since you have done a couple of changes, so we need to go and. Save these changes that I can see my. Examples out there the one sort or few sorts. We can have more example that we call as a few sorts. Now we have got one sorts only, so one example that we have produced. Under the system masses, although it is already aligned with something to do with the marketing campaign, but now we are going specific by setting an example. This is what we get to see. Now my new prompt come. Here, so now onwards we need to consider the example that we see. So create an advertisement. That we did. Before also. All right, so this is something that we are writing again, but let's look at how. The impact is going to create by this what we have made as an example. So let's go with this. So we get to see this is being considered here because we talk about that. All right, now few things to be considered. While this response is being given to this one. But it is different from the previous one and you get to see. From the assistant that you have. Mentioned at the time of setting up your setup the system messages. So like that you can. Go and. Add. One or more 
examples that you want to take control over the response that you supposed to see. In fact, uh, there are few things that you can see now. Yeah, so this is where. Uh, see. Previously, we talked about this 2024. Same thing. So you are, yeah, I mean, like this is how you should be able to go and control or uh, to the response by infusing what you have written in the assistance of from the example part of it. So this is something that uh, we can always do that. Now, coming back to the point like the If you see, this is my sections that uh, where we have been doing the conversations by writing prompt and receiving response. But the next part is you can see is a parameters. The deployment, as I said, we have got only one model deployed. So if I deployed more than one model, I could have select the another model. I can resupple among the model which model that I would like to use. GPT-4 would be powerful than the GPT-3 that we need to figure out that. Also, we'll see that. But before I go and say that, we go to the parameters. Now I'm going to talk about these two parameters here. Now it's at maximum response. If I go and see what is that parameters, the set a limit on the number of token, the par model response, the API support the maximum of max token placeholder. Do not translate the token shared between the prompt including the system messages and the example message history and the user queries. So essentially what we are trying to tell that is how many token that you want to incorporate, like rather than 400, I can say, okay, 1000, something like this. I can do that. So this is because if I want maybe a response who is going to come with a lot of text, then we need to increase the number of token that I sub I'm anticipating in my response. Right, so this is something all we can do. The another parameters that is called temperature. There are a couple of more parameters, but I'm going to talk about this too. Now, if I go to the temperature here, what it says. The temperature controls the randomness. Lower the temperature means the model will produce more repetitive and deterministic response Increasing the temperature will result in more unexpected or creative response. You can try adjusting the value in between 0 to 1. So now it is in 0.95, so we can make it 1. It means 
So I'm going to get more a random one because this is what uh, the temperature talks about. Increase the temperature will result the more unexpected means more dynamic, more creative response rather than very concrete one by reducing the number on scale of temperature what we see. So with that, I can clear my previous stuff. I can go and add a new prompt here. This is the new one that we are seeing the create an advertisement for a cleaning sponge. My temperature value has gone up. And I just go and try getting that. So this is more. Uh, kind of uh, it is different from the previous one. Try to give you some kind of innovative. Result that you can explore this. I can take it back to the zero. The minimum one. So I can go and remove the the previous one because this time I want to start with the new with the new parameters without keeping the previous concept. So I'm going to use the same one by changing. And then we can take a look. How the impact. Can be created by changing the temperature values out there. So you can compare the both that we got before and you got now. This is more with a specific response that we see. So temperature parameter control the degree of, to which the model can be created. In the generations of the response. So as I said, a low value result in consistent response with a little random variations while the high value encourages the model to add the creative elements. Its output. Which may affect the accuracy and. Realism of the response sometime. Now, having said that what we have been doing so far. OK, so what we have been doing so far. So I can do it programmatically also. I can write the code in code in Python or maybe. C sharp to do the same thing what we are doing at this moment. So how am I going to get this? So you can see view code. From the playground. And you can see the Python code by default. So if you just go and browse this code. You are importing the Azure OpenAI library. You are creating a client object. By passing these parameters, and this is precisely the endpoint of the OpenAI that we have created. We have created this OpenAI. If I go to the secure, uh, if I go to my key and the endpoint, and this is what the endpoint that I can see here. Sorry. This is the same endpoint that I can see here. 
and the key will come from this one. This is the same key endpoint and the key that I need to and the API version. Rest is the message text. You can see a system messages. You get an examples. And eventually you get an user prompt also. The user prompt may be at the time of running this applications, we have to go and get the user prompt with the temperature zero, with the max token 1000, top P frequencies and all kind of stuff that we can see. And deployment name also going to come from the name of the model that we have deployed some time back from my OpenAI Studio. The same thing I can get in in a C sharp also from the .NET developer point of views. So the concept, the programming model remains same, only the object model is going to be changed from the .NET point of view in compared to the Python. So whether the developer go and write an AI application to generate the new response from a given prompt, whether it is a typical Python application or Python and Flash application with the GUI graphic user interface, the same would be applied to the .NET application also, whether it is a console application or a web application. But the core things that we need to get the API first using azure.ai.openai or using in, in case of Python, you can see the package that we have incorporated. The Azure OpenAI is the package through which we should be able to connect to the OpenAI to make a call to the LLM that is being deployed behind that OpenAI. So now I can go to the second one that I have deployed. I can go and deploy the model that is available. Suppose I want, I want to go with the GPT. So the quota is not available. I have to increase the quota. So we need to check this for those model. The quota is available or not. But yes, we should be able to figure out the particular models and their respective quota under my subscription to deployed in that particular target region. But the same thing will happen like what we are doing here. So essentially what we say, this model can be deployed to the infrastructure that is being given by Microsoft Data Center from the different region that I would like to go and consume or I would like to use it. OK, so that is one thing that we can see the parameters and the deployment configurations as you can see. Now eventually I would like to go and deploy this. To an web application, so as it is. Whatever I have been working with this, I'm going to go and. Deploy this model behind and web application so I can go and deploy this. Create a new. So I can say demo. Gen AI. Web app. Just to make it unique. I pick up my resource group. Pick up the relay. East US where my model is created. I can go with maybe a standard one. I can enable the history by working with uh, some internal stories who can keep the history of the conversations to make that context alive. 
to the rest of the conversations that I'm going to do. So it will take uh, one or two minutes to deploy a full fledged web applications on Microsoft Azure. And this web application is going to give me an out of the box UI that I can start doing the conversations through the UI with the LLM that was deployed behind the OpenAI service. And that eventually going to go and run in the production environment. If we want them to be deployed in the productions, because now it is just a testing what we are doing at this moment. So this is what uh, the deployment has started. Eventually go and see how application will consume the open AI in order to use the LLM what we have been talking about. So in, in the meantime, so if you have any questions, you can always drop your questions through the team chat. So your question is always being welcome. We have come to an end once we are done with this. We are closing uh, this uh, session. So it is still going on deploying it. So once the deployment would be done, so I should be able to get access to the UI. That UI is going to make use of the OpenAI service behind the scene. So in the meantime, I can go to my resource group. I should be able to see my web application also that is getting deployed. This is my app service. So as of now, my deployment is not yet completed. It's still going on. So I won't be able to browse this application. But this is what we are looking for the kind of the UI, the user interface that we are going to get and uh, start doing the conversation through these web applications we, in order to consume the OpenAI service, what we are discussing so far. So it is still going on. So it's basically going to go and provision your uh, S1 service plan. Service plan is all about your virtual machine. So you need to create the virtual machines. You need to go and install the prerequisite implicitly. That is pre-installed. We need to configure aligned with our application only. But that's why it is taking a bit of time. But once it is up and ready, we should be able to start doing the conversation with. This application. So until your deployed is successful, you won't be able to browse. You won't be able to see anything. So let's not wait for that. So we'll go and anyway, so we would be kind of. Uh, going to go and get that detail. 
let me Yes, I'm back to my presentation. So I think uh, we have completed what we supposed to do to just to make you understand how generative AI can be used from the Microsoft platform, how it can be enhanced by using uh, your uh, techniques to write the prompt to get the maximum out of uh, the generative AI model. In fact, we have seen the list of model that is made available on the Microsoft Cloud platform that we can go back and deploy those model behind our OpenAI service and coming back to our playground that is being offered by Microsoft OpenAI Studio. In fact, there are multiple playgrounds out there. It may be playing with uh, Dal E and so on and so forth. So, hope this session was more informative to you to understand the platform around generative AI from platforms and tools and services from the Microsoft Azure. So thank you once again uh, to all of you for participating this uh, the webinar. And I would like to wish you all the best to learn more on the field of generative AI from our upcoming sessions. Uh, hello guys, uh, we will start the second topics in few minutes. Till the time I shared AI 900 batch, please go and redeem your batch. Uh, guys, put done after redeem your batch.
Okay, now we will start the second topic that is a uh, master develop Azure artifact. Uh, this topic will be delivered Om Prakash Pandey. He is a Microsoft certified trainer and currently work with Synergetics as a AVP delivery. Now I would like to hand over this mic our speaker. He will continue it. Thank you. Thanks, Archie. Hello and welcome everyone. Thank you very much for giving your very, very precious time to us. I know it's Saturday and everybody has been through a tough week. I hope my screen is visible to you all. Archie, can you give me a good quick confirmation on the same? Yes, sir. Thank you. It is immense pleasure for me to speak on Global Azure Bootcamp. As part of our today's topic, we'll be focusing on mastering DevOps with Azure Artifacts. My request to all of you all, if you all have any questions, doubts, queries, please keep putting it on the chat. As time permits, I will make sure I address those questions and queries. This will be a one and a half hour session. I would want to make sure I make it as interactive as possible. And at the same time, share all the nuances of Azure DevOps. And especially digging deep into Azure artifacts and package management. As part of the core agenda, I know this is a slightly optimistic agenda. So starting off with dependency management, quick overview of that, moving into package management, and then getting deeper into Azure artifacts, its integration with various package management tools. And the primary focus areas over here would be in terms of upstream sources, what are the options available, I'm pretty sure everybody's aware about the GitHub resources as well. So with Microsoft taking over GitHub, there has been a lot of changes which have ha happened in recent past. I'll just take a glimpse of, uh, give a glimpse of that before we wind up with our topic session. So this is the core agenda I have in mind. Before we get on to dependency management, guys, just give me five minutes to set the context. I'm sure you all will be, you all are able to see the diagram over here. Let me slightly zoom in to give you a perspective of what this DevOps is all about and what is the key role being played by Azure DevOps. This will also help us set the context and understanding of where artifacts would make sense, where dependency management would make sense. If you look at any DevOps project, once we have the request for a proposal shared by the customer as a solution architect with all the respective team members that we have on board, We'll discuss with them. We'll understand whether this project is doable, feasible with the current skill sets that we have and respond back to the request for proposal. Once we have got our solution accepted, once we have got our, sorry, not solution, once we have got the profile accepted that yes, these guys can deliver on the project, we can start conversing with respective stakeholders gather all the requirements, understanding of current processes, what is the end goal that the customer will want to achieve. As a solution architect and business analyst, we will need to have the domain knowledge as well. Along with this, checking for security and compliance, checking for the current team size on the customer side, what are their skill sets, what are their uh, services that we can leverage for building up our building up the final solution, what would be the training and guidance that needs to be provided 
if they already have some kind of knowledge management system on their end. So this is where our step number one would get finalized through requirement gathering. As part of DevOps, we'll be using a iterative approach. So if you say 100% of requirement will be gathered in the first step itself, it may not be true. Whatever phases we may have identified, keeping in mind what are the deliverables within those phases, we will do our respective requirement gathering. Make sure we have all the needed information captured for it. And if something is being left out, we can do uh, we can discuss that within upcoming stand up meetings. We can discuss that within various cadence calls, which happens with respective stakeholders. So once this part is being done, we go ahead with planning of resources, assigning set of tasks and activities to our respective team members. Where we can have right scheduling for each phases. Right, so we'll have our projects being created. And like I mentioned earlier, as part of the requirement gathering, each phase will have set of iterations or sprints that we are mapping. What features, what work items. Now these are the aspects depending upon. Whether we are going for scum based implementation or. Extreme approach, right? So what kind of DevOps implementation strategy that we have taken? Based on that, we'll have respective work items and resources over here. As part of these implementations, we'll be assigning these tasks to respective groups, respective people. And while they are working with this, there will be number of dependencies that we'll have. Now, as part of these dependencies, these would be local dependencies. This will be dependencies on existing projects that we have, or this could be new set of tools, resources that you want to access from a publicly available repositories. Apart from this, we can start while we are doing our planning. We can make a note of what are the associations with existing code artifacts that we have. And keeping these dependencies in mind, will be able to actually understand how much of work needs to be done within our, with our team members, how much of pre-existing work that we have, libraries and artifacts that we have can be reused. So that is the final understanding of how much of work is pending with us, how many how much of work needs to be done and how much of these resources, the base libraries we already have. And I would say that's the actual profit that comes from. So whatever timelines we may have mentioned, we can leverage on the existing resources and get the work done in a uh, uh, in a in a smaller timeline. Correct. And we can de uh, parallelly deploy our resources on multiple other projects. But all these things will be possible only if we have right set of dependencies, right set of pre-existing code artifacts, libraries that one would have one, one would have maintained within their environment. As far as the planning is concerned, all these planning can be done by using Kanban boards, Jira. Right? There are a lot of third party tools which are available. Once it comes to Azure DevOps as an environment, this is where we can leverage on Azure boards. While our team members are working on specific parts of the application. They will. Publish their code. In within their local Git repository while they're working with it. And once their task is completed, they can perform a code push. Onto the remote repository, which is a version controlled environment. Right. Quite a few of us may be using GitHub. Hub as an environment, GitHub code repository, where we have source code management tool maintaining versions of every environment, version of every code push that is being done. 
any kind of code submissions which are happening. All these things are being tracked over here. So we can make use of GitHub, GitLab, Bitbucket, apart from a lot of other options which are available. Once it comes to Azure DevOps, we have Azure Repos over here, which is completely aligned to the Git way of versioning and storing the code. Right now, if you see, there is very smooth integration that we have with all resources, all source code management resources with our Azure boards. So if a task is being assigned to a user, they have published the code. If it, all the test cases have been approved, you can automate this process and mark it as completed. Third important resource that you'll see over here, once the code is being published, we can go ahead with Azure pipelines. And as part of respective build agents that we have, we can perform these builds. Now these build agents would be Microsoft provided resources, Microsoft provided build agents, where we can queue our tasks or activities, get those things done. Or we can have self hosted agents as well. So we can have our own build server, our own build agents over here. And using these build agents, we'll be able to verify and create resources over here. See how things are working. Check the members available over here. Check the members over here and see how these. Check for how these things are being compiled, how are how these things are being processed over here. Now, once these things are being done, now for performing these kind of activities, you may have specific set of uh, options available. So you have Jenkins as an option. You have GitHub Actions as an option. You have a lot of other third party tools which will help you for create this. CI CD pipelines. And as part of these end result that we would want to achieve, we can go and publish this code, publish this build package onto as I uh, pass based services like Azure Web App in uh, the respective deployment targets, which could be staging environment, de uh, staging deployment slot, or it could be your production deployment slot. Or we can also deploy it within our IS resources, infrastructure as a service. And this will help us to achieve the final outcome that one would want. Now, as far as these deployment targets are concerned, this could be primarily targeted towards the UI team, UI testers, QA team. And once it comes to the production environment, this would be targeted towards specific users that we have. Ritesh has a very good question. Does Azure DevOps also uses Git? As far as Azure DevOps is concerned, Azure DevOps provides an integration with Git. So any code being pushed or published onto a Git repository, you can mark your tasks within Azure board as completed. As far as Azure repos are concerned, Azure repository, it's, is it, it is having its own way of implementation in the backend. It does not use GitHub, right? It has its own mechanism of repository. As far as uh, check-in, check-out is concerned, yes, you have an option of PFVC integration as well, but I don't want to go into that discussion, Ritesh, for today's session because TFVC was the older approach for uh, when uh, we had EFS as an implementation team foundation server, right? So I don't want to go into that discussion in today's session because, uh, but if you ask me, are those options available? Yes. With Azure DevOps, you can go with TFVC implementation also. Thanks for the question.
anybody else any such questions keep please keep posting it on the chat so i can take up those questions now one thing which i skipped smoothly as i moved ahead was the package management because that's the core of this session let me focus on that area so if you all look at the developer team what are they doing so like i mentioned earlier whenever we are taking up a project whenever we are planning for it at back of our mind we are very clear that not 100% of these things will be delivered or will be programmed locally some of these things we will have to take from the available third party resources or we have pre existing libraries that we can leverage upon as an organization what we would be doing is whenever we even before we take up the take up the first project right or while uh, uh, other team members are busy in terms of marketing <laughs> sales right uh, promoting the organization right developer organization and back end we will start creating some of these design patterns start writing code artifacts for them start uh, creating our own documentation for what would be the best practices guidelines right all these things we would start creating them in the back end and we can have local repository of such resources so whenever we get a project right around 20 to 30% of the required code will be available with us now even for writing those best practices or design patterns we would need to refer third party resources here which could be maven repositories new git packages python or php based members right this is where we'll have our public artifacts so there will be two set of artifacts over here one set of artifacts will be your private artifacts correct which is uh, critical for the given organization which is something which is owned by an organization something which is a differentiating factor in to other competitors or something which is unique within the same organization and in these scenarios we need to make sure we have right set of libraries please be careful i am not saying latest i am saying right set of repositories now why is that required all those things i am going to discuss about in the session okay so i hope this gives you all a right context sorry i forgot about the the foundational or cross cutting elements over here let me quickly cover that before i delve into the artifact section while i was mentioning about azure boards while i was mentioning about the code being published in the repository who is working on that so as far as the users are concerned we have azure active directory which is the older name the new name that we have is microsoft entra so all the users are registered users groups respective service principles all of them are registered inside microsoft entra id this is where you'll have the user identities being stored and to these users we can assign appropriate set of roles permissions on different aspects within our azure devops okay now while this entire team is working towards facilitating completion of the customer code required resources by the customer side details in terms of monitoring logging tracking of the kpis very very important aspect how much percentage of the code that we had promised within phase 1 or within iteration 1 how much of that is being completed are we on track are we lagging behind right that thing has to be taken care over here apart from that if i want to find if the project manager or any other stakeholder wants to dig out that i want to find out relevant information about the underlying system you have your respective query management systems finding out 
total number of bugs, total number of issues or concerns that we have. We can do that. All these components that we have, they are organized as organization within Azure DevOps with respective projects inside that. Like I mentioned earlier, you can have appropriate role based control. Role based access control, which team member can perform what set of activities, right? I was mentioning about association between GitHub, Bitbucket, right? Other uh, uh, other resources and tools that we have. Now those associations will happen by using relevant members available on Azure DevOps marketplace. Where you see a lot of pre existing members, pre existing components which will help you smoothen up the integration between the third party available members with our Azure boards. Correct with our pipelines and third party resources. Because. Even though I may be talking about Azure DevOps in today's context, but I cannot forget that there are large number of tool sets that we have within. DevOps as a practice, OK, DevOps as an environment. So any new vendor or even if you say Microsoft as a vendor, they will also have to align or give services aligning to these kind of expectations and requirements from the. End users. And here when I say end users, these are people from. Development team, operations team. Uh, Business management team, analysts, analysts and quality engineers that we have, right? So all of them are parallelly working over here. So you can have your monitoring of applications, logging, security and compliance, any kind of quality checks which are required, bug fixing, uh, sorry, uh, bug identification, right? So all these things have to be taken care parallelly at at each and every level, at each and every bunch of tasks being performed over here. So generally what we do guys is. As part of our sessions that we deliver for the customers, we make sure we complete this entire process end to end. Right, but since this is part of our uh, quick showcasing of the dependency management. So that's our focus area. Let me delve into that. I'm sure everybody is clear with. The context setting the overall. Azure DevOps environment and which which of the components will make sense at which place. Let me proceed ahead. Go to the core of this session. And now let's deep dive into dependency management. I'll quickly run through some of the key areas or needs for dependency management. If we look at any modern software development, whenever we are building any kind of complex projects or solutions, we we'll always require dependencies. Now, one would say, Om Prakash, can you please give us an example of what do you mean by this modern software development? OK, so let's take an example of Angular application. Let's take an example of React as an application. Let's take an example of .NET core or .NET application that we are building today. And can anybody tell me? Do we have need for referring to NuGet packages? Do we have need for? Uh, referring to packages within the Maven environment. Right, do we have need for downloading all the required JavaScript foundational JavaScript libraries? Which will help us build that project. So these three examples that you all take. This is primarily what I'm talking about once it comes in context of modern software development. Now I know that everybody's on mute. Otherwise, everybody would have started sharing their 
set of challenges or issues when they had been downloading npm packages what was the problems people would love sharing their experience when they were trying to add a new get package instead of dotnet core package they would have downloaded dotnet framework package and they would have got into <laughs> set of problems or concerns there downloading a wrong jar file right and the entire application has come to stand still so i know there are series of experiences that everybody would love to share how they have been stuck or what was the problems they had faced especially in context of dependency management now i don't have to explain why dependencies these dependencies that we are talking about these could be on other projects other solutions and like i was earlier earlier mentioning about the local or the uh, primary work that we would have done for other projects for other solutions and we are being a software engineer being a solution architect being a developer we are very very smart i would say and when i say smart what do i mean by that we are smart to identify what is something that can be generalized and it can be stored as a library for a future usage we know what is specific to that project and we know what could be generalized so all these generic resources all these best practices that we have understood <laughs> after performing lot of mistakes lot of uh, uh, challenges or issues that we had correct so we have learned from our mistakes and we have realized that if these things can be stored separately this could be generalized and stored separately we can leverage or use these libraries in future okay because if you if i know about the industry every team may not have a project every now and then so when they are not on project then what should they do this is what they should invest their time on seeing what we can leverage and again i am not getting into the area of non disclosure agreement but at the same time i am looking at the reusable artifacts reusable resources within my environment that's what we refer as dependencies if you're looking at any software development there will be multiple parts and there are components that can be reused i already mentioned about this point next important resources if you want to figure out the dependencies one very important step that we do is we create components correct and and when i'm saying components it could be service components it could be ui components as well correct so if you are looking if you are using any kind of ui based development like react angular or uh, if you are looking at power platform or if you are looking at any other environment so there will be reusable components in terms of the backend resources right the design the best uh, uh, design patterns that we have right along with that we could all we could also have the ui components which could be reusable over here so we can create set of readily available components whenever we get a new project right so what we would need to do is we would need to assemble these projects once again assemble these components once again and what that would help you do is since these components are pre tested pre verified pre approved right so your speed of development will be 10x 20x 30x depending upon how many such components you already have created and kept it ready so how do you think these organizations like infosys wipro tcs how they are to able to take so many projects and they are able to successfully execute all of them magic <laughs> the magic over here is of the software dependencies the library that they have built over a period of time with every domain 
with every new environment coming in and they are pretty smart they are saying okay this is some this is a new domain for me so i would need more time for this whereas the previous one this is a domain where i have already worked this will take lesser time for me but from a cost point of view they will be charging the same cost from the customer they would also add additional cost as per the inflation correct but at back of their mind when they go in the planning phase they know that 80% 85% of these components are already there with me i just need to assemble them test it get it verified get the customer uh, approval taken on that and i can i am ready to roll out this project to my end users so guys i am taking some time over here to explain you all the significance of power of dependencies so once it comes to these uh, fourth point that is use existing code this is what i was talking about if we go to the last point over here that is component maintainers now who are they so when we are using these nuget packages when we are using this uh, maven repository obviously there has to be someone who is maintaining that maintaining the previous versions and with each versions you will also see a documentation and this documentation categorically clarifies that these are having dependencies on a specific version of java java 11 java 17 java 21 java 8 they have dependencies on other package versions that we have other uh, module versions that we have right so when we are choosing a package when we are choosing a library we need to make sure all other members that you are choosing all the components you are picking or other library that you are taking all of them are of a right version set and everything is being documented very very categorically so we'll have to understand that and that is the key role being played by component maintainers they will have to test whether all these components are working together as part of the creators that we have right who are building these applications building these software generalized softwares and uploading it onto the open source repositories all of both of them have to be aligned to it because there are billions and trillions of software uh, vendors or people who would be leveraging or using these resources to make sense in this madness three things are very very important so first is standardization second is the package formats and sources that we have and the third is versioning so whenever like i mentioned earlier the significance of creating software libraries every team member can start creating their own library right so there are five things which i have saved over here second developer would create their own his or her own repository and that would lead into a chaos so there needs to be a standardization so that uh, but see the intent may not be wrong i'm not questioning the intent intent is very good no problem with that but the problem is there has to be some common standard of how these standard libraries or generic libraries need to be stored correct how to make sure we have the right documentation we have the other uh, dependencies relevant dependencies being mentioned clearly in the documentation like i said this particular module requires this version of java this version of dotnet this will work with dotnet core 6.0 only this will work with dotnet 4. Uh, dotnet core 4.5 right so that kind of standardization has to be mentioned over here <laughs> otherwise we are creating a reusable component and we are leaving it to the developer boss you decide how you are going to use it you decide uh, how to come out of that problem and resolve it right so standardization will solve that problem so the hard work that every developer is doing in generalizing that software we will bring sense to that madness will sorry not madness we will bring sense to that effort and we will solve the 
problem of madness over here of having different set of standards with different developers. Now, within standardization, what should we do? That's that's the next point here. So here, what we can do is we can specify a package format. Correct. We can specify a specific method for how should you do this packaging? Should it be as a WSP file? Should it be as a zip file? Right. So what would be the package format? How this will be associated with set of tools that we have? Correct. So through your XML as a resource or if, if there are uh, uh, partial commands, right? Or if there are Terraform commands. So with each of these members, with each of these automation tools that we have, they should be able to identify these packages and as part of the build process, they should work together with it. So if you remember, while I was discussing about pipelines, what is the job of a pipeline? Job of pipeline is to uh, create a complete running software and deploy it onto the right environment. I'm sorry, guys, I'm not getting into build a pipeline versus release pipeline that, that I will do in some other conversation. But here, what we need, the build pipeline, what it has to do is it has to make sure the source code is compiled correctly. And for compiling that, it needs to make sure all the required artifacts are downloaded. All the artifacts are uh, with their their right versions have been verified correctly, right? So that's the key thing that your pipelines will have to do. But for that, you need to have right package format, and you have to mention the source correctly, so that they can retrieve the relevant packages from there. From versioning point of view, this is where we can have your appropriate versioning strategy. Major version, minor version. What is the amount of changes that we are doing, right? Which is the recent release that you're doing. And like I said, with each version we do, and uh, when we are publishing this version, we need to mention the other dependencies also. When I say versioning, uh, and a newer version of a software is being published, there is there is some feature addition that you are doing, some kind of new. Uh, new enhancement that we are adding. Now for that enhancement, what were the other dependencies? So we need to mention that. OK, now once you have finalized that, once you have finalized the base element, base libraries. Now comes. Sharing this resources now. Uh, What is the significance or what is the relevance of this member? Based on that, there will be some organizations who would want to make it available as an open source. We don't want to charge anything for it. Whereas other organizations may also make it a paid entity. Since the code which I have written is specific to a domain, solves a specific problem, and we think this is a unique differentiator that we have required by more number uh, required by niche kind of audience. I would want to charge for it. OK. Again, I'm not discussing about the payment option and the marketplace over here. That's a separate part of the discussion. But if you have to uh, make it sellable, if you have to make it available to everyone here, what we can do is we can Package them. We can first do a com uh, componentization of that, create separate components of it, right? And then aggregate number of these components to formulate it as a package. I'm not sure when you'll have been working with NPM packages or whenever you have been working with uh, downloading any of the Java based jar files or New get packages. There is a lot of you just mentioned one command, right? You just mentioned one point saying this is what I want to. Add to my current project, but when you execute that command, it take it might take half a minute or a minute at times, depending upon what are the other dependencies. 
So the 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 actual command that you are giving is the package name, but within that package there are a lot of dependencies because that's the top level package. So package componentization would mean what are the sub elements that you have or elements within that package connected to that particular package. So this could be correlated with other packages. This could be correlated with other modules that you have in the backend so that once this package is being downloaded, you have the complete component ready with you. So this is the mechanism of how we can have software distribution being that. How do you want to wrap these things or package these things as one entity? So before I go ahead, anyone, any questions still here? In terms of dependency management, dependencies in terms of softwares. Perfect. I don't see any questions over here. Let me proceed ahead. I want to say, Om Prakash, what is the uh, mechanism? How do I identify? Whether I can come up with some kind of libraries, come up with some of the resources over here. So in this environment, if you see. In our current project, we can check for duplicate code. Right, certain code which is being repeated time and again. Across multiple modules, right? You can check that, generalize it and create it as a separate library or a separate component. Second important resource that you'll see is high cohesion and low coupling. Right, too much of code being repeated again and again. You want to increase cohesion. Uh, you want to decrease that cohesion. Right, that's where you can. Check for how we can implement those things. Along with that, if you see some of the components which have individual life cycle or their on the of their own. So if you look at something like Spring Framework, there are a lot of third party members, third party resources that can be injected when and where required, but they don't have to be part of the code. Say for example, security or authentication authorization libraries, right? So you can inject that from outside and they can have their individual life cycle. Fourth member over here that you can look for is stable parts, a piece of code which is not changing every now and then. So I have already extracted the code. I have checked for high cohesion, low coupling. I have checked for components, individual life cycle, right? Then I can segregate that part outside. After moving that library outside, we'll need to observe how many number of times there are changes happening on that environment. If there are too many changes happening very frequently, then it need it cannot be translated to a library. But if there are stable parts, if it is not changing that frequently, then we can go ahead with our code base. We can map it as a reusable library and start using it in all of the uh, in wherever applicable, whichever places they are applicable, we can start using them there. So this completes with our First section. Let's go to the second member over here that is package management. So as part of my conversation, I have been mentioning about these packages again and again, right? So from a .NET point of view, you have NuGet packages, which could be part of .NET framework or could be part of .NET core. In .NET framework, we had, and if I'm not mistaken, we had Majority of aspects over here, which was NuGet packages. Uh, sorry, uh, earlier we had number of members which was assemblies. Okay. After uh, maturity of .NET framework towards the end, and .NET Core coming into picture. This is where we had NuGet packages, and with .NET Core as an environment where everything that we are creating has to be from the 
existing packages or libraries, Nuget packages will play a very, very vital role. Okay. Nuget packages will play a very, very vital role. When it comes to your NPM packages, I have already mentioned about this. This is primarily focusing on React, Angular, And whichever resources we want to pull from here, whichever resources you want to pull from perspective of React or Angular or uh, Backbone, any other JavaScript based applications, all of them are working on NPM packages, which is node package modules. Third important resource that you'll see from a packaging perspective is your Maven repositories. Now, once it comes to NuGet, NPM, Maven. These can be publicly available, right? These can be private libraries as well. So depending upon our requirement, depending upon our expectations that we have, right? We can go ahead and create these members, create these relevant resources. Now, once it comes to your Maven repository, here you have something called as a POM file. I'm not sure how many of you are aware of that. We have a uh, XML file over here. POM.XML. And within this POM.XML, we can specify what are the dependence or other uh, relevant members that you want to add to our project. Same thing goes through with the Python, Python packages, Python package index. We have a lot of third party libraries available here. We can have our, our Docker packages as well. There is a complete repository of Docker images. And using these Docker images, we can make sure we can we build our application, we build our resources. And using these resources over here, what one can leverage upon is we can create our application with minimum set of challenges because we already have the base library. We have our base uh, libraries over here and using these base libraries, we can package them. We can inherit from the existing members so that around, like I said earlier, 80 to 90 percent of our tasks is being taken care. As part of my conversation, I have been mentioning about two types of feed managers over here. So one type of feed manager would be our private components, private members, and second set of resource over here would be our public members. So when you're looking at NPM, when you're looking at node package managers, right? In each of these scenarios, you'll have both the options available. So you can have your local NPM management, right? Local uh, local Maven repositories, and you also have a public members available. Now, once it comes to these resources over here, especially when you're working with the private repositories, here what we can do is we can pick up these details from our local packages. We, may, we can pick up resources from our local packages. So as an organization, like I mentioned earlier, we have taken a lot of efforts to create this local repository. So what I would want to do is whenever I want to add any resource, the first step which I'll do for my developers is I will associate them by using the relevant tools that they are working with. So I want to first ensure they are using local artifacts before they go for a public artifact, right? So then there should be an option for local repositories and their respective systems or the or the developer development tools that they are using. They should first go for local artifacts. After they have taken care, after they have used resources from local artifacts, right? And if it is not available there, then should then they should go to 
public artifacts. So there, there is another name for it. So private artifacts or local artifacts. And we have public artifacts. So private artifacts, this is this should be the first place or first repository to look for. Second member over here. Would be going for public artifacts. So leverage on whatever hard work our team members have done, right? So whenever you are trying to add a package, it should be searching the feeds from those packages, right? So first checking for local package, local repository for those packages. If not available, then go for the online packages or public packages. Now, what are these public package sources that we have? We have your NuGet gallery, NuGet.org. Right, this is our first resource that we have. Now, what is NuGet all about? I don't have to explain that. So, people who are from .NET background, they would know about it. If you are coming from JavaScript background, jQuery, Angular, React, any other JavaScript based members, you can look at NPM packages, people from Java background, various JAR files. You can see these implementational options over here. You have your Docker Hub environment, hub.docker.com. The UI has changed recently. If you click on any of these members, you'll be able to see the information regarding those images, regarding that resources. This was the initial UI. People who have worked with Docker Hub environment. Here you have billions and trillions of pre-existing Docker images available. We can leverage on that. But with each of these members, the core advantage which I see is so there, uh, there are repositories or websites where you can get this information, but they may not be reliable. Here, these are maintained by specific bodies, which is much more reliable. I would still recommend that don't have too much of dependency here. You can download these resources, download these packages, make a local copy of these members. The reason being, in future, if there is some change which has happened over here on the repository, because we don't know some mishap happens and there is some problem on these packages, right? And if we have our dependency here, this could create a problem for our software execution, right? So uh, while building your application, you have verified that these packages are working. Whatever is that state, retain a local copy of all these packages. And believe me, it, it does not require too much of space because all these are compiled and pre-built packages. So it does not take too much of space. And if you are looking at a uh, successful and stable builds, right? It is essential that we have minimal dependency on the online resources or online components. We should have our own local copy, local repository being maintained. And we, uh, through that, we can ensure that any time in future, even if it is uh, published on customer side, and there is any changes being required, I can go back to my member and uh, go back to my library, make that change and get these things working. So we have resources available for Python as well. So depending upon whatever set of tasks and activities we want to do, what will be the relevant packages for it? You can go to your 
public package sources and retrieve that information. Along with this, like I was uh, enforcing on creating a local copy of these resources, these are the options for self hosted, right? Self hosted in sense locally, you can create your own server. So, locally, what we can do is we can create a NuGet server over here, have a dedicated machine. For NPM, you have set of tools available like Synopia, CNPM, JS. For Maven, you have Nexus repository, you have various artifactory options available. You can install Maven locally on a, on a uh, shared machine or dedicated machine and associate all your developer environment, developer resources with that artifactory URL. Along with this, you can have your Docker, local Docker hub being created by using Portus, Harbor. You can have your Python server, PyPy server as well. Right? So you can have your own local servers available. You also have SaaS private feeds, and this is where Azure artifacts would make sense. Right? So as far as Azure artifacts are concerned, this is a self-hosted, uh, sorry, it is a SaaS based package, but it is within the organization's environment. And here we can give appropriate permissions to our developers and other team members, right? In terms of if anybody wants to make a change to that, right? Any kind of upgrades, any new resources being published over there, correct? So all these things can be governed, can be managed smoothly without any problems when you're using Azure Artifact, right? So this is a primary area of focus for us in today's session. And I hope everybody is able to understand the relevance of Azure Artifact in context of the DevOps environment and in context of uh, Azure DevOps environment and in context of dependency management and package management. Now, once it comes to Azure Artifacts, it can be used at multiple places. It can be used as a Maven resource. It can be used and configured along with your NPM packages. Sorry. Once it comes to Docker, for uh, Docker Hub, you can make use of Azure Container Registry. We already have a separate dedicated service for it. For Python, you can make use of Azure Artifacts or you can make use of Gem Fury. So you have these options available for SaaS based pricing, SaaS based resource available. I would recommend to go for Azure artifacts in context of NuGet packages, in context of NPM and Maven resources, right? Now, one would say, oh, Prakash, we already have got these packages created from our developer team. They have gone ahead, written relevant code over here. We have got a local repository being created, everything being done. We have our uh, uh, local copy of all these data or uh, package information which was available on the, on the cloud environment or SaaS based service. All of that we have copied locally. What next? How do I consume that package? So when you are consuming these packages, first aspect is identify your required dependency in your code base, like how one would want to go ahead and uh, uh, add a NuGet package or add a jar files, correct? So that would be your required dependency. Say for example, I want to perform a logging. I want to perform a test. I want to create a UI, right? So for each of the requirements that we have, or if you want to create a ORM based implementation. So for each of these expectations or requirements, what is the relevant dependency that you need? Find a component that satisfies the requirement for the project. So now you go ahead and start 
searching for it. Find that component, check that version. Now, when you are checking this version, where will it search? Will it search in the uh, in the local environment, local private repository, or is it going to search in the public repository? Now that has to be configured correctly so that the priority is being given to the local package. And if it is not available, available in the local package, only then it should go to the remote repository. Here, what we can do is we can install the package within the code base in the development machine, right? And go ahead and create the software implementation for it. Now, one of the important elements that you all will need to do is you all would need to configure it within your within your tool. So whether you are using Eclipse as a tool or whether we are using Visual Studio as a tool, each of them would have their own options. Each of them would have their own mechanism of how this package sequence can be mentioned over here. If you'll see this under the tools section, if you'll see the options available, along with a lot of other details that you have, you have NuGet package manager, and here you can specify the package sources. So, what is the package source that you want to mention? You can look at, you know, in your environment if you have 2019. Right, or if you have uh, 22, not an issue. In both of them, you'll be able to see the respective package sources over here. And here, what we can do is we can mention our package source. Right. So, what is the, uh, and here we can mention the URL. Okay. Here you can mention the URL of your. Artifact repository, which is on your Azure, Azure DevOps environment, we can mention that as a package source over here. So right now it is by default configured to check for NuGet.org first, right? So we have to change this sequence. We have to change this sequence to make sure it should first check for. The local environment, and then it should go to the cloud environment. Okay? And that mapping has to be done over here. Now, this would be different in terms of Eclipse. This could be different in terms of VS Code, right? So each tool will provide you this option. We can we can check for that and specify right URL for the NuGet environment. So this is how one can go and consume the relevant packages that we have. Now, keeping this context in mind of dependency management, Azure DevOps, DevOps as a complete environment. Let's go to Azure Artifacts. What are the key resources over here? What are the members that are available here? As far as Azure Artifact is concerned, even if you all would have realized in our Previous conversation in uh, in the initial slides, we said Azure artifacts can help us work with npm, NuGet packages, and the Maven repositories. So three important aspects over here. From your development team point of view, this would be a single place. This would be a single entity where all your artifacts will be mapped. Everything at one place. Right. And like I said earlier, when you're building this application for the first time, you may have to go to the public repository, download it from there. But next time onwards, once you're doing a build or when you're performing the next set of actions, everything will be mapped to Azure Artifact. So let Azure Artifact be a single place where everything is being 
stored. All dependent libraries are being stored. Second important member, once you have gathered all these details, publish it, share it. Share these members, share these packages with everyone else. Right, and how this can be done? This can be done with the infra infrastructure team, the operations team, and guiding them, saying, please go ahead, map it in the tool, so that any new, uh, any new implementation that we have, right? Any new change that we have, all these things should be picked from the shared repository, shared Azure artifact repository. From consumption point of view, we can associate NuGet package, Maven, NPM, Python libraries, all these things will be part of our Azure artifact. If you look at uh, Azure Artifact, what I already mentioned about in terms of security policies, right? We can specify those elements, specify those permissions for the end users. From a retention point of view, these written, you can have retention policies for Azure Artifacts because now it has the packages, all the package information that we have. The storage consumption updates might take 24 to 48 hours, how many people have connected, right? What are the details that you have? In terms of packages, if something gets deleted, there is a 30 day date recovery window. Because there are so many people that might be working with it. Somebody who has permission may have accidentally deleted some of the critical packages. Correct? Right? So what do I do? Go ahead, go to the recycle bin. From there, you should be able to get it or raise a support ticket with Microsoft. So, with that support ticket, you will be able to retrieve your deleted Azure artifacts. Now, these, like I said, these artifacts are very, very critical dependencies to all the softwares or all the applications that we are working with. So, if there is any critical dependency which has got deleted, it will stop or it will. Uh, stop the functioning of your application. And that could be a big problem. So deletion of an artifact is very, I would say it, it would be a crime within an organization because this will impact a lot of other applications. So we'll have to be very, very careful with this. And uh, to, to, to secure this, you can have right identities, right set of security rules being assigned and give permission to relevant individuals only. Correct. Avoid giving any kind of delete permissions, right? Or owner permissions to the users. Give them upload permission, update permission, view permissions. That will help getting the uh, resource, right? Using that member easily. At the same time, avoid any kind of deletion of critical resources. From Scope's point of view, we can give permission on organization scope, project scope. We can leverage on the public feeds that we have. Right. So I'm not saying it's a replacement for existing package management platform. They will still remain because they may have millions of resources. I would want to have just 10, 15 of those resources. So I can download it from there and make a local copy of local copy for my project. Right, so this is what Azure Artifact will help us do. Let me stop here. Let me go back to my Azure environment. So guys, as part of your Azure environment, if you'll have a uh, Azure subscription, Here, you can look at Azure DevOps. You have an option of Azure DevOps organization. Right? So here you can go to your uh, Azure DevOps organization. So what are the pre-built projects or pre-built resources that you have? If you don't have a project, 
right? So we can create a new one. That's not a problem. So once we have our project created, what is the project name? What is the visibility that you want? Public, public or private? What is the version control? This is what I was talking about. So Ritesh, if you are there, you can see this. So this is where you have option of selecting the team foundation version control. Whereas what I was mentioning about in terms of the work items and templates, you all will be able to see the options available here. Agile, basic, CBM, CBMI, scrum based approach. So what are the resources that you want to see over here? If you want to create a new organization itself, we can do that. Specify a name for it. So for every new customer or uh, what do you say, a, a major change in terms of the approach, there you can go and create new organizations, create new members over here, give them appropriate permissions. So I'm not creating a new one because I already have a lot of pre-existing uh, now I already have pre-existing organizations. I already have pre-existing projects over here. Let me go within a given. Uh, let me go within an existing project. So here, if you see, you are you are having four members here: boards, repositories, pipelines, test plans, and artifacts. So we discussed about quite a few details or uh, I, I should say I have discussed about a primary understanding of what is Azure boards. So you can see the pre-existing project over here, how we can schedule things, how we can map these things over here. How we can take a look at the backlogs that we have, product backlog. If you look at the members over here, you have uh, options for sprints. So within a given sprint, what is the current sprint that we are working on? And within that string, uh, within that sprint, what are the tasks or activities which are completed, which has to be done? Any kind of information that one would want to fetch? So we can write our queries over here. What type of work item? What is the current status? Right, so this is your Azure board. So anything in terms of scheduling, anything in terms of assigning it to a team member, all these things we can do using Azure boards. Then we discuss about repositories. So here you can see your pre-existing repositories and their respective branches. If you want to initiate a new branch over here, we can do that as well. Within your repository, you can have relevant files over here, your scripts, templates, and this will help you create the resources. Say, for example, I would want to deploy this in uh, Azure subscription by creating a web app. Now, how to create that web app? You are right, Ritesh. This is very similar to a Kanban board. And this is called as a Azure board. Right? So here, if you look at the options available, we have respective files, whatever commits that has been done, any kind of merges which has been done, we'll be able to see over here as a diagrammatic representation. So whatever changes has been done and who has made that change, you all can see all that information here in terms of code pushes, in terms of 
branches which are there any specific tags which has been mentioned anybody wants to make a change they can initiate a pull request then we discussed about the pipelines over here so what are specific pipelines from where do you want to get your project on which uh, from which particular branch and once that branch is being retrieved once, once that code is being retrieved how do you want to build it how you want to make it uh, execute correct what is the mapping for it and once the mapping is being done once the mapping is being done we can specify the steps over here within the pipeline I hope this makes sense for you all. So we can have a separate session for how one can work with pipelines. What are the ways? So we can, to which we can add more details or action items within this. So if you see the first step over here, it is NuGet restore. Right. So whatever is being mentioned within the project, first make sure you download all the packages. And like I said earlier, as far as these packages are concerned, here we can configure what would be the NuGet, NuGet version, what is the path to your NuGet EXE. Right, so if you see the options available here, running this as a task, so what kind of actions and activities you'd want to perform while doing the new get restore and this this these steps that you're seeing all these steps are part of your new get restore and the step that we are performing once we have looked at the pipeline section let's move below and let's go to the artifacts over here okay so from Artifacts perspective. Here you can see OMP artifact. You can see OMS Pandey artifacts. So whatever artifacts I had created earlier, we'll be able to see the artifacts over here. As far as these artifacts are concerned, we can connect to an existing feed. Apart from that, we can also create. We can also create a new feed over here. Let me create a feed name as GABC feed. What is the visibility if you want to make it available to specific people or all the members of this organization? They will be able to view the package. What is the upstream sources available which you want to map? Right. So here I would want to include packages from common public sources. What is the scope that you would want? You want the uh, current project and only within this member artifact resources should be used or you want to make it available to a specific organization. Right, this is project and organization. These are two scopes that we have within our artifacts. Let's go ahead, click on create. This is my GABC feed. I can connect to NuGet EXE. So here if you see, once you're doing this project setup, ensure that you have installed the latest version of Azure Artifact Credential Provider. 
we'll have to make these changes we'll have to um, add these things within the uh, respective machines within the developer machines so that when uh, they can configure it with their uh, tool like i mentioned about vs code visual studio 22 2019 or eclipse so they need to configure it over there and once they have configured it once they have configured it and they start writing the code the moment they try adding a new new get package correct what it will do is it will go to the it will it will come to this artifact see if those packages are available here if not it will download that package in the artifacts and then make it available to the developers right so this is a process that we have when we connect to the feed so you are searching within the members over here you can check for any specific new get package or npm package that you would want any kind of maven repo maven repository that you would want there are other packages upstream packages available that is new pack cargo right so you can mention your respective package names over here which which resource you want to download right so this is what i what we looked at in terms of scopes in terms of A recycle bin, your public feed options that we have. If you look at the view feed views over here, we can have a local view available, pre-release or release views also available. Now, like we have been mentioning about, as far as these versions are concerned, right? The versions will keep changing. the versions will keep getting upgraded now in these scenarios what we can do is we can promote or demote a particular package so if a particular package has been deprecated by the service provider right so what we can do is as part of our new release we don't want to refer that particular package so keeping that kind of requirement in mind keeping that kind of dependency in mind we can demote a particular package i already mentioned about the role based access control so to which members do you want to give permissions to which of these members we want to avoid per, avoid viewing that artifacts so we can give appropriate permissions over here so if you look at the new developments that is there new features which is being added the first member that you all see when we when we are adding the uh, when you are searching right for the new resource you have a new support for cargo cargo crates which is focusing on rust development along with this you have also association with google maven repository right which is an alternative for maven central as far as maven is concerned this this has been a major source of repository for java applications for a very very long time so if you want to make your local uh, repository local implementation over here we can make use of maven repository within azure artifact third important resource that you'll see is your partial gallery i'm not sure how many of you are from azure automation background correct so within azure automation there has been huge increase in terms of automation resources and one of the key option is your partial gallery so within your up within your upstream source one of the common thing one of the additional things that we can do is add a partial gallery any of your partial functions that you have right or any kind of uh, partial workflows that we would want to add over here we can do that in the partial gallery and this partial gallery can be associated with your azure automation so
so whenever it is downloading or whenever it is looking for the templates right so it can pick up this template from your artifact repository from package manager in okay so before i proceed ahead anyone any questions still here are you able to correlate the azure artifacts yeah i can see only questions coming from ritesh so guys ritesh is my good friend but uh, even others can ask questions right so uh, thanks for the question ritesh as far as the uh, feed is concerned feed primarily is stream of packages stream of relevant dependencies that we have that's why it is called as feed so package is something which is a final uh, component that we are referring to but in the back end it has series of dependencies and in simple english i would say this is actually your complete code that you are downloading the foundational code that you are downloading that's what is referred as feeds Anyone else? Any other questions? Great. So once it comes to your package managers, while I uh, mentioned earlier about package managers, we refer to different words here, right? Just a quick look at it once again. So just to make sure I don't miss them. So once it comes to your .NET, you have your NuGet. CLI. What I showed you all on uh, uh, Visual Studio 22 that was using the menu item, using the pre-existing tool, right? That's one of the options. You also have package manager CLI available, or the new get CLI available here. Can you see this package manager console in the bottom? it is using package manager host i take a moment once it is done we should be able to see the package manager console so any new resources you want to download or you want to add you can do that by doing a right click adding a reference of that particular nuget package that's one option second option is you can do it through your package manager console the cli so while it's taking time let me also start with visual studio 2019 okay this will take a moment so one aspect like i said within dotnet you can make use of vs code sorry visual studio the tools which is available or you can make use of the cli as far as java is concerned here you have maven and gradle for python for rust as a language here you have your cargo crates and you can have options for other universal packages as well support for different set of programming technologies which makes azure artifact as one of the uh, most prominent package manager within the organization boundaries we already discussed about the upstream sources so using these upstream options that we have we can auto save the copy of your package from public save public sources correct right? and let me repeat this once again this is something which will ensure the stability of our application correct right? so even in future if the vendor goes and decides or the package manager new npm or nuget they go and decide that we want to add some code or remove some code from the pre published packages right pre released packages which is actually uh, which actually should not, never be done but in case something goes wrong I, I i don't know what could go wrong 
right? So, but uh, because of those challenges, because of those issues, I, I don't want to sabotage my customer's project. That's why auto save the copy of package from public source. So once it has ran successfully, once it has been published successfully, all dependent members, I want complete ownership of that. I am not saying we will not use uh, the licenses or we will not uh, uh, give give credits to those members. Yes, I will do that. But again, that should not stop execution of my project. That is my intent over here. Second important member is support for multiple public registries that we saw earlier. Public feeds now supports your upstream sources, right? So you can download resources from there. Specify what elements or what entities that you would want. Right? So once you have your respective packages being downloaded, you can associate them with your local members. Now just imagine, guys, if we have to create four different servers, NuGet as a different server for NuGet, different server for NPM, Maven Central, Python, instead of creating these four different machines locally available, which would be a shared environment, shared file server kind of environment, and then people accessing resources from there. Right? That could be one approach. Second approach could be connecting to internet, connecting to artifact, which is Azure artifact, which is part of our organizational uh, uh, service that we have been using, correct? And picking resources from there. So we are saving on cost of four machines. And again, if you have large number of uh, team members, it's just, it just needs to be highly available, right? Lot of other infrastructural dependencies. So all these addresses are, all, all these concerns are being addressed by upstream sources over here. From security perspective, I have already mentioned about various roles. You can have a reader role, collaborator, right? Contributor or an owner role. What kind of tasks or activities one would want to perform over here? Or what tasks or activities you want to allow your team, mem team members to do? For each of these roles, my request would be to create relevant groups within our Microsoft Entra or your Azure Active Directory. And we can give permissions to those specific groups rather than giving these permissions to individual users. Because through that, it will be easier for us to manage these resources in future. I think this should give us understanding of what permissions should be given. So maximum number of times we should give reader permissions so that people can go and download and install those packages within their code. That should be good enough. Once it is being approved, once it is being verified, we can have another member as collaborator, uh, contributor who can go and save the packages from upstream sources, push packages, unlist or deprecate packages. So he's, this guy is more like a manager over here. Right? But, the, but still, contributor cannot go and delete or unpublish any package. There should be a individual or there could be a owner group highly uh, responsible group i would say who would take the complete ownership of ensuring the complete management goes correct maybe a team lead or maybe a project manager at our end who can be promoted as a presenter over here present who, who can be promoted as a owner over here for our artifact repository from Azure pipeline integration. So till now what we have done is we have got all the packages. We have associated that with our developers, right? So that part is being taken care. So here if you if I go back to my diagram, this part we have addressed. This association. Sorry, a wrong arrow.
So this part we have addressed where each of the developers, they can connect to the local machine or they can connect to local artifacts, which is available within Azure artifacts section. So this part we have already managed. Okay, so developers, when they are publishing their code or when they are pushing their code, all their code which is being compiled is by using the local repository. If there was any third party resource being mapped, all of that is being downloaded over here within Azure artifacts. So this has become a central repository for all the third party resources or all the local code which was being referred or referenced or used within the applications. Right, so this part is being done. The code is compiled successfully. They have published it over here. What happens to the pipelines? So there needs to be an association between the pipeline and the repository. Okay, so there should be an association over here. Now, how does that association work? What are the ways and means of doing that? So when the build process happens, see the build process is happening on the source code, which is there, right? And source code does not have the libraries. It has the compiled, it has a code which was being submitted by the developer. And once that code starts working, uh, starts compiling here, it will start giving an error saying, I'm sorry, I did not get the required dependencies. Where are the dependencies? The dependencies are on the local machine. They have been downloaded or they have been referenced over here. That's not in the pipeline. So what pipeline needs to do is it needs to connect to the artifacts, download the members from there. Or reference all the resources which is being mentioned over here. That would be our step number two. Now, how will that happen? Again, there is no magic here. So let's understand the commands that needs to be written within our Azure pipeline to make sure we are able to integrate this smoothly. So as part of the tasks being mentioned within our pipeline steps. We need to mention the input commands over here. What is the command that you want to mention? What are the parameters to it? Packages to pack is a CS project. What is the destination for it? And this will be for the new get package. If you look at the Maven, Maven uh, task, Specify different options over here. Sorry, specify different parameters over here. JDK home, Java version, right? And what is the authenticated feed, right? Maven authentic authenticate feed as true and deploy the resource here. Now, using these members, what it will do is it will connect to your artifact repository and it will publish the artifact on the mapped repository. I'm sorry guys, I'm running short on time. Going back to our resources. So here, as part of the certification, what Microsoft has done is we already have AZ400 as our certification title for Azure DevOps. I'm sure everybody is aware about that. From perspective of package configuration, there's a dedicated lab for it, which I would recommend you all to go through. That is package management with Azure artifacts. So whatever details I have discussed with you all, all that steps is being mentioned. You all need not uh, install the, all the required softwares provided you already have some of this, these softwares 
on your local machine. If you all don't have these resources, you can install it locally. Or if you have a Azure subscription, my request would be create this environment, create these resources onto a Azure VM, and you can test out these resources there. If you see my current application, which I have created, right? I already had this eShop web project where I was showing that uh, uh, details to you all. So all the Azure boards, pipelines, everything I have got it by replicating this resource. 